I'm going to go get started, and we'll see. Other folks may trickle in, or they may be bundled up at home, <laughs> away from the cold. When we get started, as I think most of you have figured out slash remembered, we're going to be starting Psalm 118, Orthodox Study Bible, Psalm 119 otherwise. And you're going to see why I stopped before starting it last time, if you haven't looked at it already. <laughs> uh, let me quickly give my non-introduction introduction, which is the introduction to the Psalms, if you're listening to this on the website. Uh, I did twice in the first two Bible studies on Psalms, and I didn't do it again because it's long, and we were going very slowly through the Psalms. So now... <laughs> If you want to hear that, you can go back and listen to it, neither of those, and otherwise we can go ahead and get started. Unless anybody had any questions or comments or anything else left over from last time. Okay. Well, as you may have noticed, Psalm 118 of the Orthodox Study Bible 119 otherwise is the longest psalm in the Bible. It's also the longest chapter in the Bible, if you, treat it like, <laughs> if you treat it like a chapter in one of the other books. It's 176 verses, so it is very, very long. <laughs> um, it is actually broken up into pieces. If you're looking at the Orthodox Study Bible, they don't really label the pieces. There's just sort of these gaps, these little spaces, where they've left a couple carriage returns. They break it up into sort of chunks. If you have uh, another English translation, they probably have a funny looking symbol <laughs> and or a word in a foreign language <laughs> as, a, as a subheading before each part. And what those are, are the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Okay, so the first one, it's got a symbol, it probably looks something like that. It says Aleph, spelled something like that. And then the next one will be Bait, and then Gibble, etc., through the Hebrew alphabet. And the way this, this long psalm is structured is that in each of these sections, each, what we would call a sentence, <laughs> uh, because remember there was not punctuation in the original, but each sort of little chunk of text starts with that letter. Okay, so it's what we would today call an acrostic poem. Where, for example, today if you were going to do something like this, you would have a heading A. And then you'd write a poem and all the sentences would start with the letter A. And then you'd have B. And all the sentences would start with the letter B. Now, I'm assuming the reason they left these subheadings out of the Orthodox Study Bible is that, obviously, in Greek, words don't start, you know, it's a different alphabet, <laughs> and words don't start with the same letters, let alone in English, right? <laughs> in English, obviously, the whole first part doesn't, none of it, I think, starts with A. <laughs> that's it. The same word, none of it starts with B. But that's the original, that's the original structure. So, I was asked beforehand, this one's so long, why didn't they break it up? <laughs> right? Well, it sort of already is broken up in the sense that it's in these chunks, but also because they're this structure with the alphabet. It's obviously one big, long, <laughs> very long piece. Yeah. And if, if any of you still have that I handed out way back when we started Psalms, uh, I handed out that chart that had, if you're, if you're going to read the Psalms the way the church does, especially in monasteries where you go through the whole Psalter every week. There was one reading that the whole reading was Psalm 118. <laughs> this one is just read by itself because it's so long. Right? Because it's like reading. Each of those sections is essentially a Psalm unto itself, and so you're essentially reading a big batch of 24. <laughs> yeah, if you, go to a, if you go to a monastery, 
where they do the, in addition to it, the weekly cycle having its own spot. If you go to a monastery for the lamentation services that we have, we do here on Friday nights in Holy Week, where we do the lamentations around the tomb. If you go to a monastery where they do the whole service, it starts out with the reading of this entire psalm. You can understand why. I mean, that service, when we do it here, is how long? Two and a half hours? Something like that. Easy. And we don't do the whole... <laughs> we can, there's parts we cut out. You know, so you can imagine taking you know, a two and a half, three hour service and then adding this to the front of it. That's why not as much in parishes. <laughs> but, but if you go to a monastery where they do the whole thing, because at, at, a, at monasteries, that service goes all night. And it ends with the liturgy in the morning. You know, we have the service, and then we have people who do the vigil within the service in the morning. But at a monastery, it'll go straight through. It's an all-night service. So that said about how it's put together, before I start reading, what's it about? Right? you got to hang your hat on. And... So this psalm is basically what we would call a wisdom psalm in that it's talking about some of the same topics that we're going to see when we get into the book of Proverbs, the wisdom of Solomon, wisdom of Ben Sirach, some of the other wisdom literature we're going to start reading, Song of Solomon, once we're done with psalms. And without going into the whole introduction I'm going to give into the book of Proverbs, (laughs) basically what wisdom is, is... It's taking the law, the Torah, right? God's teaching to us. It's taking that and applying it to our lives, right? Applying it to everyday situations, right? God has given me this commandment. Well, what does that mean in terms of, you know, God told me I'm supposed to love my neighbor. Okay, well, what does that mean now today when my neighbor is playing loud music at three in the morning and I'm trying to sleep, right? (laughs) So, the, learning how to apply those, that is a specific, that's what wisdom is. Okay? That's what wisdom is, in biblically. Okay? And so, essentially, this big psalm, and I'm going to pause as we go through it, I'm not going to read it all straight through. I'm going to need a drink at least. Um, but as we're going through, that's to keep in mind, because we're going to hear a lot about the law, about contemplating it, about understanding it, about applying it. That's what, that's what this psalm focuses on. Okay. So Psalm 118, Orthodox Study Bible, 119 otherwise. Blessed are the blameless in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who search out his testimonies. They shall search for him with their whole heart. For those who work lawlessness do not walk in his ways. You commanded us regarding your commandments that we should be very diligent to keep them. Would that my ways were led that I might keep your ordinances. Then I would not be ashamed when I regard all your commandments. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with an upright heart when I learn the judgments of your righteousness. I shall keep your ordinances. Do not utterly forsake me. Okay, so this sort of sets up that that theme and that idea. Right? And blessed are the blameless who walk in the way of the Lord. What does blessed mean? The word that's translated usually blessed in both the the Old Testament and the New Testament, the idea behind it is something akin to to be envied. The person the person who you should want to be like. Right? This is this is the sort of the goal. says happy on those. Right. Happy is a very bad <laughs> translation. But the idea is that should be the goal. And, and we'll talk about that more when we get to Matthew 5 when we talk about the Beatitudes. Where Christ says, for example, blessed are the poor. Where everyone's scratching their head going, what? <laughs> blessed are those who mourn. You know, What? That's kind of what I was trying to avoid. <laughs> That's not what I was aspiring to. <laughs> okay, but here, here, blessed are the. So, what we should aspire to, what we should aspire to be like, 
Are the blameless in the way? Well, who are they? Those who walk in the law of the Lord. So, the law right away, we talked about this a little bit last time, we tend to think of the law as this list of rules, and if we break a rule, God gets mad at us, right? Punishes us, you know? And so we follow all these rules because we're afraid of getting punished. But that's not the perspective of scriptures, especially not this psalm. This psalm is going to go on and on and on about how much the psalmist loves God's law and how great it is, right? He doesn't dislike it at all. He's not scared of it at all. He thinks it's wonderful. Because the idea here is that those who follow it, right, have a blessed life. Right? They have a life that is truly good. That's what's to be aspired to. And so he's asking God to help him walk in those ways and keep those ordinances. (coughs) Not because... Not because he doesn't want to go to hell, right? That concept isn't around. But because he wants to lead a good life. So the second part, starting in verse 9. How shall a young man keep his way straight when he keeps your words? I search for you with my whole heart. Do not drive me away from your commandments. I hid your teachings in my heart so as not to sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your ordinances. With my lips I declared all the judgments of your mouth. I delight in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I shall meditate on your commandments and I shall understand your ways. I shall meditate on your ordinances. I shall not forget your words. That first image is one that we're going to see a lot in wisdom literature. This idea about an older man teaching a younger man. You know, sometimes it's going to be the first person. To say, my son, <laughs> you know, go and do this. Sometimes it should be phrased just like this. But how shall a young man keep his way straight? What does that really mean? Well, that's what most young men or women ask at some point. What am, what am I supposed to do with my life? What am I going to do with my life? Right? Why am I here? Well, the answer that the Psalms give us is to keep God's words. What am I, what am I, what should I do? <laughs> what direction should I go? Follow, follow what God has taught us. Right, and you won't go wrong. And again, we see in uh, verse 14, this idea, he delights in the law as much as, as much as in all riches. Right, your average person probably aspires more to be rich than to keep the law of the Lord <laughs> right? in every way of their life. But he's saying, that's why he's saying, keeping the law of the Lord, living a godly life is better, is better than being wealthy. Well, if you look at this part, even down to verse 6, excuse me, down to verse 16, what it's saying is, and it's, this is admirable because this is somebody who is studying the word of the because he's not going to forget his words. He's going to walk in the ways of righteousness. Okay? So it's a very um, complimentary yeah. to this. And it's very beautiful when you look at it. I delight in your testimonies. I delight what you have done for me right. and, and, and the creations. But at the same time, not taking credit for it. Right. right. It's not written for the position of boasting. I've done everything right. I've kept all your... In fact, he said in the first section, he commented on being ashamed when he remembered he some of the commandments. And, he, and, 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 and throughout God's word, one of the things that always has grabbed me is the spiritual quality of it. Not interested in riches, not interested in wealth, you know, that sort of thing. It's like, Lord, we follow you first. We give up everything. Right. And, and, and a very, very beautiful passage. So verse 17, reward your servant, I shall live and keep your words. Unveil my eyes and I shall understand the wonders in your law. I am a sojourner on the earth, do not hide your commandments from me. My soul long to desire your judgments at every season. You rebuke the arrogant, those who turn aside from your commandments are accursed. Take away reproach and contempt from me, for I searched your testimonies. For rulers sat and spoke against me, but your servant meditated on your ordinances. For your testimonies are my meditation and your ordinances are my counsel. Now that 
We passed over it quickly in verse 19. But that word sojourner, a lot of times it's translated alien in the King James Version of the Old Testament. And a sojourner and an alien means you're someone from another country who's in a country that's not yours. Right? Remember there are all those commandments about how you had to treat those people because they didn't have any legal right. You know, they weren't a citizen. Wherever they were, they didn't have any legal rights. You could treat them however you wanted. And so how you treat them was sort of a mark of your morality. Well, what the psalmist is saying here, right? remember the whole, the whole near-term goal in the Old Testament was to not be a sojourner anymore. Right? First they were sojourners in the land of Egypt. That same word was used. And then God brought them out of Egypt. Right? And their goal was to get to their own land where they could settle down and have their own kingdom. Well, they blew that and they went into exile and they were sojourners again. Well, the psalmist here takes it a step farther. He says he's a sojourner on the earth. Right? He's a sojourner on the earth. Meaning, this whole earth, regardless of how settled he might be, is not really his home. Long term. He's from somewhere else, and he's going somewhere else. And while he's here, he's sort of a foreigner. The King James God says he's hired stranger. Stranger, yeah. Not at home. And this is this is an idea that uh, St. Peter's going to pick up in First Peter. That we as Christians are to consider ourselves sojourners in this world. That this world is not our home, ultimately. Yeah, verse 19. So verse 25, My soul cleaves to the earth. Give me life according to your word. I made known my ways and you heard me. Teach me your ordinances. Cause me to understand the way of your ordinances and I shall meditate on your wonders. My soul fainted because of its listlessness. Establish me in your words. Remove the way of unrighteousness from me and with your law have mercy on me. I chose the way of truth. I have not forgotten your judgments. I cleave to your testimonies. O Lord, do not disappoint me. I ran on the path of your commandments when you enlarged my heart. Notice again here, he's not claiming to be perfect. Uh, And we've talked about this a lot going through the Old Testament. Is one of the big mistakes that you can make is to come up with the idea that God's law doesn't include repentance. That God's law is just this list of rules, and once you break one, oh well, you're done. (laughs) That's it. Right? But one of the primary commandments in that list of commandments is when we sin to repent right. so he could both say I ran on the path of your commandments right, and say remove the way of unrighteousness from me right. and that's how he can say a sentence like in verse 29 in the second half with your law have mercy on me right. when God has mercy on someone He's not ignoring his law. <laughs> right? Saying, oh, well, I'll let you slide. <laughs> right? <laughs> Even though he did this thing. When he has mercy, he's having mercy because of his law. Because part of his law is that if we repent, he forgives and restores us and heals us. Right? So that mercy is included. It's built into what God has told us about himself. Verse 33, give me as law, O Lord, the way of your ordinances. And also, just a comment. When reading this, don't get too technical about law, commandments, ordinances, because really they're just trying to mix it up a little. <laughs> a little a lot, in a lot of cases, this is the exact same word over and over and over again, so I'm trying to make it sound a little nicer. Give me as law, O Lord, the way of your ordinances, and I shall always search them. Cause me to understand, and I shall search out your law. And I shall keep it with my whole heart. Guide me in the path of your commandments, for I desire it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to greediness. Turn away my eyes that I may not see vanity. Give me life in your way. Establish your teaching in your servant in regard to your fear. Take away my blame which I have suspected, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your commandments. Give me life in your righteousness. 
And so we have a couple things here. One is, verse 34, Cause me to understand, and I shall search out your law, and I shall keep it with my whole heart. And so his approach, when he's reading the commandments of God, and he runs into something troubling, is that he doesn't understand it, so he asks God to help him understand it. He says, if you help me understand this, I will follow it. And that's very important when we consider the alternate orientation, which is the one I'm more prone to, and I think most people are more prone to, which is you get to something in the Bible that's troubling, where it's clearly saying I shouldn't be doing something I've been doing, for example, right? And you try to explain it away or try to find a way around it. Well, that doesn't really mean what I'm doing. That means, you know, something else. That was, that applied back in ancient Israel, but that doesn't apply now, or, you know, play the, the shell game with it, right? That's not the psalmist approach. The psalmist comes to something like that and says, God, if you help me understand this, I will follow it, whatever it is. No matter how hard it is, no matter what it says about me. But if you help me understand it, I'll follow it. And then the second, again, notice, notice what he contrasts following God's law with. Aspiring to live a life according to God's law is the opposite of, in verse 36, is the opposite of greediness. It's the opposite of aspiring to wealth. Or in verse 37, vanity. It's the opposite of aspiring to a good reputation and being complimented, being <laughs> of your own, pursuing your own ego. Those are two other things he could be pursuing with his life, but he's choosing instead choosing instead to follow after God's commandments. Verse 41, And may your mercy come upon me, O Lord, your salvation according to your teaching. Then I shall answer those who insult me with a word, for I hope in your words. Do not take away the word of truth completely from my mouth, for I hope in your judgments. So I shall keep your law always, forever and unto ages of ages. And I walk in a broad space, for I searched your commandments. I spoke of your testimonies before kings, and I was not ashamed. And I meditate on your commandments, which I love exceedingly. And I raise my hands to your commandments, which I love, and I meditate on your ordinances. Remember your word to your servant, in which you give me hope. This comforted me in my humiliation, for your teaching gives me life. The arrogant transgressed exceedingly, but I did not turn away from your law. I remembered your judgments of old, O Lord, and I was comforted. Despondency held me because of sinners who abandoned your law. Your ordinances were sung to me in the place of my sojourning. I remembered your name in the night, O Lord, and I kept your law. This happened to me in the night because I searched your ordinances. We see another contrast here in verse 51. The arrogant transgressed exceedingly, but I did not turn away from your law. Why are the arrogant the opposite of what he's doing? Well, the arrogant are those people who follow their own judgments. He keeps talking about God's judgments. God looks at things, the things he created, and he calls them what they are. He calls it like it is. And we can follow his judgment and what he said about things, or we can follow our own judgment and how we feel about things. And the end result of the arrogance of following our own judgments is that we transgress exceedingly. Right? And we end up verse 30, 53 responds to me, help, despondency help you because of sinners who abandon your law. So the idea here is that in that, in that way you end up with hopelessness. Right? Hopelessness. Because rather than seeing things as they are, as God has described them, as God has, has taught us, you're trying to bend them to be what you want them to be. And it doesn't work. Verse 57, You are my portion, O Lord. I said I will keep your law. I sought your presence with my whole heart. Have mercy on me according to your teaching. I considered your ways and I turned my feet toward your testimonies. I prepared myself and I was not troubled that I might keep your commandments. The ropes of sinners ensnared me, but I did not forget your law. At midnight I arose to give thanks to you because of the judgments of your righteousness. 
I am a companion of all who fear you and keep your commandments. O Lord, the earth is full of your mercy. Teach me your ordinances. O Lord, you dealt with your servant in goodness according to your word. Teach me goodness, instruction, and knowledge. For I believe your commandments. Before I was humbled, I transgressed. Therefore, I keep your teaching. You are good, O Lord, and in your goodness, teach me your ordinances. The unrighteousness of the arrogant multiplied against me, but I will search out your commandments with my whole heart. Their heart was curdled like milk, but I meditated on your law. It is good for me that you humbled me, that I might learn your ordinances. The law of your mouth is good for me, rather than thousands of pieces of gold and silver. There's some of the same contrasts in that last section between wealth and and the teachings of God. But notice here particularly, Saul talks about this time before he was humble. Right? This time when he was arrogant and transgressed the law where he tried to follow his own, his own way and God humbled him. And he's thanking God for doing that. Right? He's thanking God for knocking him onto the right track. Right? We talked about this concept before that one of the differences between Israel in the Old Testament and the other nations was that the other nations would sin and sin and sin and sin and sin and do all this wickedness and evil and it would reach this point where God would say their cup of iniquity is full and he'd wipe them out. Right? We saw that again and again when we were reading the historical books. With Israel, with Israel, because he loved Israel and had picked Israel out of all the other nations, Whenever they sinned, he disciplined them. They started to sin, he sent somebody in to invade and oppress them. Until they turned back to him, at least briefly. <laughs> and then when they fell into sin again, he sent someone else. Or he sent a natural disaster. Or he said, right, he constantly corrected them. He didn't let it get to the point where they would be destroyed. He corrected them. And this is where St. Paul gets what he says. Uh, that God chastens, meaning punishes, every son whom he loves. And this is a little bit of what, was, what we heard today in the epistle reading this morning. Right? You say, you know, St. Paul has this thorn in his flesh, and he's, he ends up, you know, he prays for God to take it away repeatedly, and God says, you know, my grace is sufficient to you, and he ends up sort of thanking God and boasting about his weakness. Right? Because that means, that weakness means he's being disciplined. And what does that mean? That means God loves him. If you have a child and you never discipline them ever at all, you let them go play in traffic. (laughs) Right? You just let them do whatever they want. Let them eat whatever they want. If they want to pull out a bottle of bleach and drink it, you let them. (laughs) Right? Do you love that child? You don't care whether that child lives or dies, obviously. Right? The proof right, of how much you love them is how much time you spend disciplining them and trying to shape them in what is right. Okay? And so that's the psalmist's understanding of the discipline he's seen from God in his own life. Right? Something I mean, we don't get a lot of detail. He was humble. Right? Being humbled, I've been humbled a few times. It's not fun. Right? Another word for being humbled is humiliated. <laughs> being humiliated is not fun at the time. Being disciplined by your parents isn't fun <laughs> at the time. In fact, I probably a few times did the, you know, I hate you. I wish I was never born routine. <laughs> at my parents <laughs> right? when, they were, when they were disciplining me. Okay? Because I was a child and I didn't understand <laughs> When you get older, you understand, like the psalmist understands, the things that have happened to him in his life from God. He's no longer a child who says, God, why'd you let all these bad things happen to me? <laughs> right? He says, these things that happened to me, thank you for them. Because they got me back on track to where I needed to be. When I was starting to become arrogant and I was on my way to destroying myself, you got me back in line. When I was about to go play in traffic, you grabbed me and drug me back at the house. Right? <laughs> When I was about to drink the bleach, you slapped it out of my hand. Right? So he's, he's thanking God for that discipline and that chastening. Okay. Verse 73. 
Your hands made and fashioned me, instruct me, and I will learn your commandments. Those who fear you will see me and be glad, because I hope in your words. I know, O Lord, your judgments are righteous, and you humbled me with truth. Let your mercy be for my comfort according to your teaching to your servant. Let your compassions come to me and I shall live, for your law is my meditation. Let the arrogant be shamed, for they transgressed unjustly against me, but I shall meditate on your commandments. Let those who fear you turn to me and those who know your testimonies. Let my heart be blameless in your ordinances, that I may not be disappointed. My soul earnestly longs for your salvation and I hope in your word. My eyes strain to look at your teaching, saying, When will you comfort me? I am like a leather bag in a frost. I did not forget your ordinances. How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment for me upon those who persecute me? Transgressors describe their meditations to me, but these are not like your law, O Lord. All your commandments are truth. They persecuted me and justly helped me. They almost ended my life on earth, but I did not forsake your commandments. Give me life according to your mercy, and I shall keep the testimonies of your mouth. So here... There have been hints of it already as we've been going along. But one of the things that really comes out in this section is that if someone is trying to follow the ways of the Lord, right? it's not just that, well, they're trying to follow the ways of the Lord, so they're going to have a good life, and these other people aren't, and so they're going to have a bad life. But the fact that they're trying to follow the Lord and other folks are following ways of wickedness puts enmity between the two. All right, well, what does that mean? Well, the example that St. John gives in 1 John is he said, Cain killed Abel because Abel's deeds were good and Cain's were evil. Right? That the fact that Cain was a doer of evil meant not just you know, well, we have different lifestyle choices. We can agree to disagree <laughs> with Abel. Right? It meant there was enmity between the two. Right? And the response to that enmity that we keep seeing is what? From the one side, from the wicked, from the sinners, right? They're trying to force their will on the righteous man. So, for example, verse 85, transgressors describe their meditations to me, but these are not like your law, O Lord. Right? They have their own philosophy <laughs> of how to live life and what to do. And they try to force that on him. Right? But he doesn't accept it. <coughs> so what do they do? They slander him. They oppose him. They, and he continues to what? To meditate on the law of the Lord. He's sort of trying to be nonplussed by the whole thing. <laughs> right? He's trying to just continue on with all of this assailing. And of course, the ultimate example of this comes when when God himself becomes a man in Jesus Christ and walks on this earth. And it's not just like, oh, well, he's a really good man, <laughs> better than me, but what happened? We have to kill him. Right? We can't, there's no agree to disagree between him and, and the Pharisees, between him and the religious officials. It was, he needs to die. He needs to die. And like the psalmist, Christ didn't reciprocate. Christ's response was that, no, all of you are going to die. <laughs> and to destroy us, quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. Okay. So, and, and this is what Christ then warns his apostles about when he's leaving to ascend into heaven. Right? He says, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. Right? He says even, you know, a time is coming when someone who kills you will think they're doing God a service. Right? So, part of what we have to remember is that when I say we follow the ways of the Lord and we live a good life, right? I've said that several times tonight about this psalm. What is our picture of a good life? Okay. Well, we already saw I can't mean by good life being rich, right? <laughs> because we've already seen pursuing getting rich and following the ways of the Lord aren't the same thing, right? And it's not self-aggrandizement because we've already seen that my ego <laughs> and God's teachings are not the same thing. Okay, well here we see if your goal is to be really popular and well-liked, <laughs> right? 
and to have everyone around you think you're wonderful, that's not going to happen if you're following, if you're following the way of the Lord. So what do I mean then when I say live a good life? Right? Well, ultimately, if you don't have a concept of the world to come, it doesn't make any sense. Right? If you don't have an idea of the world to come, it doesn't make any sense. Because if I spend this whole life basically miserable, if I spend this whole life poor and humbled and hated by everyone, and then I die, and that's it, <laughs> right? Then the transgressors with their meditations kind of have a point, right? <laughs> that's kind of, it kind of makes sense. If, however, me following God's teachings means I'm beginning a life that isn't going to end. Right? And that's what's meant by eternal life. Right? My life had a beginning, but it's not going to have, it wouldn't have an end. Right? Then, getting on that path, being part of that life, as opposed to being part of a way of life that's going to come to an end, there's no comparison. There's no comparison. Right? If I could choose you know, 40, 50 years of being rich and well-liked and proud or eternity. <laughs> it's not even really a choice when it's put that way. When it's put that way. So that's what, when, I, when I say a good life, I really mean eternal life. Right? I really mean a life that lasts forever. Right? I mean, it really mean a life that, as we said, where this period on earth is a sojourn. Right? It's a sojourn. It's travel out, away from our home with a return to our home coming. Right? As opposed to the, the others whose home is this world. And we're happy with it and looking for what they can get out of it right here and right now. Didn't have a strong idea of the afterlife, exactly. Yeah. So how did they <laughs> Well But they write like they do. Well the the idea of course is that you know God doesn't change. Right? So it's not that we aren't saying that because the Hebrews didn't have it nailed down that there wasn't an afterlife then and there is now. Right. Right. So we're and and as we've said, as I said, say at the beginning of each book, ultimately everything in the Old Testament is about Christ, right? And so they hadn't seen Christ in the flesh yet. So this kind of stuff is hazy, right? So the, the ideas are here in seed form. Like I said, it doesn't make sense without a life of the age to come, right? And so. While they don't have it nailed down, we're getting all of these hints. Right? We're getting all of these spoilers. Right? You know, like it's, it, the first time, if you've seen The Sixth Sense, I assume it's something. Okay. The first time you watch The Sixth Sense, they drop all the clues all the way through. Right? But until you see the end, until you see the twist ending, you don't notice any of those clues. Right? You don't understand what's going on. See the twist ending, all of a sudden you go back and say, oh! All these things that happened all along, right? I should have seen that. That's essentially what happens to the apostles, <laughs> right? To the disciples. You know, they keep writing in the gospel, even in the, in the gospel text themselves, we didn't understand what Jesus was talking about at the time, <laughs> right? Until after he rose from the dead. He rises from the dead, and all of a sudden they go, oh! <laughs> That's what all these things were about. So... Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's when they split that switch. So, with, so without, without knowing Christ and Christ rising from the dead and, and knowing eternal life, we can't really understand this, is what I'm saying. Right? That you're right, it doesn't make sense taken by itself out of the context of 
right? And that, that's, that's our position as Christians, is that the Old Testament as a whole doesn't make any sense, except as the Old Testament that comes before a New Testament. It's incomplete without it. You don't. It doesn't work without it. Does that make sense? Sort of? Sort of, except they wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> right, but what, what they wrote was poetry, especially in this case. Right? Poetry about, and this, I mean, this isn't, as I said, sort of this experience culminates with Christ. Right? The Jews were living in captivity in Babylon. We're going to get to the book of Daniel probably toward the end of next year. <laughs> and in the book of Daniel, we're going to see all the time Daniel and his friends, who were Jewish people trying to live in the Babylonian and then the Persian empires, where they, for example, refusing to eat certain kinds of meat, or them refusing to participate in the pagan feasts or worship this or that idol, is going to have them ready to be killed. Okay, So they can, they can identify with this on one level. You know, I'm trying to keep the ways that God taught us by eating a certain way, worshiping a certain way, doing these things, and these Babylonians or Persians are ready to kill me for it. Right? On that, on that level. Right? Now that we've seen Christ, we can see that that, that enmity wasn't just a coincidental, th- you know, it wasn't just strife between Hebrews and Babylonians in 600 BC. Who cares? Right? <laughs> but that that's part of a bigger picture. It's part of a bigger picture, right? That leads up to Christ and his death and resurrection, right? And then we can see how that plays in our own life. So they didn't understand the whole big picture necessarily yet. But they had a, they had a piece, or pieces, right, of the whole that God had given to them. And so they weren't necessarily able to piece it all together, from the limited parts they have, but they they could understand those little individual pieces. Does that make <laughs> tough room? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> but so so but that's that's the idea, All right? So um, when when. You know, Moses wrote down in whatever language he wrote it down in the forerunner to what became the book of Genesis. You know, uh, the seed of the woman. You know, the serpent will strike his heel, he'll crush his head. Right? He probably didn't have in his mind 1,300 to 1,500 years from now, there'll be a, a son who's born to a woman who's never been with a man. And he'll grow to the age of 32 and be executed as a criminal by the Roman Empire and rise from the dead. Right? That probably wasn't... He probably didn't have that all laid out. But what had been revealed to him in the vision he'd had from God about what happened in Genesis about man's choosing sin, right, was that that wasn't the end of the story. Right? And that, and that God, through one of Adam and Eve's descendants, was going to overcome the serpent. The serpent wasn't going to win. Right? So he doesn't have the whole picture, but he's got this little piece. And now that we have the whole picture with Christ, we can now go back and look at that little piece and see how that little piece fits into the whole, the whole thing. Is that... Yeah. Get okay. <laughs> Any other questions before we? So there is no benefit from being a Christian unless there's an afterlife. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> although, 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 say Paul does say just about that. It depends on what you mean by benefit. Uh, but say Paul says if Christ. If, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ did not rise. If Christ did not rise, then our hope is in vain, and we are of all men most to be pitied. So that's pretty close to there's no point in being a Christian if there's no resurrection of the dead. It's close. <laughs> if it's not, then that's not what it's saying. 
So because I mean that's what the, I mean, the gospel St. Paul preached was that Christ had risen from the dead and conquered death. If that's not true, there really isn't there isn't a Christianity. <laughs> <We're here. laughs> so it'd be more correct to say, I think, in this context, there's no point to Judaism. <laughs> there's no afterlife. Right? That Judaism, Judaism, the Old Testament without Christ doesn't make sense. The Old Testament, it's not that the Old Testament has this nice pat religious system and then Christianity comes along with a different one. But it's that it's that I've argued, I have been arguing all through here, this really doesn't, a lot of the Old Testament makes no sense, real sense whatsoever without, <laughs> without Christ. It only has any real meaning when you interpret it in the light of Christ. Obviously our Jewish brothers and sisters would disagree with me. But <laughs> that's the Christian perspective. The Christian perspective is not that we're going back and reinterpreting the Old Testament. It's that we're reading the Old Testament and it's part one of a two-part arrangement. Yeah, but Martha, I mean, can't you say the Jews are still waiting? Some of them are. Some of them are. Some of them are. Yeah. I mean, there, you know, the, the most bizarre are the Messiah hasn't come. Right. So some all this of them. stuff is still... And there are some of them now who have even gone back and reinterpreted to argue that there isn't going to be a Messiah. So, it de- yeah, it depends. <laughs> because, again, there's, there's not a clear... There really isn't a clear cut religious system, especially once you take the temple out. I mean, how much of the Old Testament that we've read has been about sacrifices? Well, Jews haven't been sacrificing any animals for the last 2,000 years. 1943. But, <laughs> rounding up. But, <laughs> close to 2,000 years, they haven't been sacrificing any animals for their sins. Well, if you were going to try and put together a religious system from the Old Testament, that would pretty much be the central part of it. You know, so... so the Christian point of view is that we're reading the Old Testament for what it is, and they've gone back and reinterpreted it to read Christ out of it. What happens to them when they die? I mean, is it a void? Who, Jewish people? Yes. <laughs> well, that they believe? Yes. Oh, that they. Well, it depends. There, there are some Jewish groups that believe, believe in an afterlife of some sort, and there are some that don't. There's some that just think there's a void. That's it. You see through this. It's kind of sad. Yeah, I don't. There was a there, there was a, a Jewish person of our family's acquaintance in Texas who described himself as an atheist, but had a separate apartment for his daughter so they could keep kosher <laughs> and go to and go to an Orthodox synagogue and learn all the Jewish traditions. I'm going, if you're an atheist, why bother? But I have a different perspective. I'm a so Christian. they got to be good. <laughs> well, it's, it's just sort of a cultural, it's just sort of cultural traditions. You know? And I, again, I don't see, if I were an atheist, I'd stay home on Sunday and watch football in my underwear. But, <laughs> you know, apparently, there's some people who, don't believe it, but go anyway. I, I, don't, I can't identify with that point of view, but but it is one. <laughs> so, and it's and it's sad. It's sad, really, ultimately, because you know, as Saint Paul says about the, the Jewish people, they have the Old Testament. They were given all of this by God. And they were given all these traditions that were supposed to lead them to Christ. Right? And, and they've gotten crosswired so that it's now it's just sort of an end in itself. Just sort of tradition for tradition's sake. You know, and it's disconnected from the real reality that it was supposed to, to bring them to. So it's a sad thing, really. Okay, verse 89. 
forever, O Lord, your word continues in heaven. Your truth continues from generation to generation. You laid the foundation of the earth and it continues. By your arrangement, each day continues. For all things are your servants. If your law were not my meditation, I would have perished in my humiliation. I will never forget your ordinances. For in them you gave, give me life, O Lord. I am yours, save me, for I search your ordinances. Sinners waited for me to kill me. I understood your testimonies. I saw the limit of every accomplishment. Your commandment is exceedingly broad. How I love your law, O Lord, is my meditation the whole day long. You make me wiser than my enemies with your commandment, for it is mine forever. I understand more than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the elders, for I search your commandments. I withheld my feet from every evil way that I might keep your words. I did not turn away from your judgments, for you taught me your law. How sweet to my taste are your teachings, more than honey in the honeycomb in my mouth. I gained understanding because of your commandments. Therefore, I hate every unrighteous way. Now, a comment there. There's two things that really bring up the same idea. And this is important. Again, this is a little bit of preface to when we get into the wisdom literature. Because this is a wisdom psalm. You notice he brings up the fact that your word continues in the heavens. Your truth continues from generation to generation. You laid the foundation of the earth. By your arrangement, each day continues, for all things are your servant. It's important that God's law, right, his teachings, is connected to the world he created and the way things are. I said that quickly before, when I was talking about God's judgment. He calls things what they are. Right? Reality. There's not a, there's not a disconnect between God's law and his commandments and the world we created and lived in. What do I mean by that? Well, the you'll hear people talk about in our day and age a lot. They like to use the word values, right? Talk about values. We need to teach our children values. People need to learn values. Where that word comes from in a moral context is from a 19th century German philosopher named Schaler. Max Schaler. And basically, the way he described the world, and this is basically the way most modern people see the world, is that the world is essentially morally neutral. Right? Things just are. There's a tree. It's not good or bad that there's a tree. The tree is just there. Right? <laughs> Trees there, rocks there, we're here. Right? Things just are the way they are. And we as people choose to value certain things more than others. So an example they would use would be gold. Not a particularly useful metal. Right? It's kind of soft. It's really heavy. <laughs> right? It's not like you're going to build weapons with it. You're not going to build tools with it. Anything useful. The people have chosen to value gold. And so gold becomes money, becomes a medium of exchange. Right? Or a dollar bill. A dollar bill is a piece of paper. Right? It's not really worth much of anything. But we've given it value. Well, they say the same thing is true in morality. Okay. Being honest isn't really better than being dishonest. In fact, sometimes being dishonest could have benefits, right? <laughs> being dishonest could get me more money. Being dishonest could get me out of trouble. Being dishonest, right? But we've chosen as a society and as a culture to value honesty. And so we need to teach our children to value honesty. Right? They're not being honest for any reason. It's just we like honesty. <laughs> and so whatever it is, honesty or uh, pe people's property, we've chosen to value people's property rights. So you shouldn't take other people's property. Right? It might be advantageous to you to steal something, <laughs> but we don't value that. Now, what we as Christians say is very different than that. What we as Christians say is, God tells us that stealing is wrong, or that lying is wrong and sinful, or that certain types of sexual conduct are sinful, because they are actually wrong. They are actually evil. 
that doing these actions will bring about your destruction. Right? God gives his commands to us as a warning. Right? If you go out and commit adultery, you will destroy your marriage. You will destroy your family. It will have actual consequences. It's not just that we value marriage. Right? We've chosen to value marriage. Right? God has chosen to say that this is good and this is bad for no real reason. Just arbitrarily. Right? No. The things that God has told us not to do, he's told us not to do because it's like playing in traffic. Right? Because it's a bad idea. It will destroy us. We think in the short term it is happening and it won't. That's important that we keep together. Because values can change. Right? Values can change. How we feel about marriage as a culture can change. American culture felt one way about marriage in the 1940s and 50s, and it feels a very different way about marriage now. In terms of how much and how it values it. Okay? What God has to say about marriage doesn't change. Because marriage itself, human beings who get married haven't changed. How children are conceived and born hasn't changed. And so what God has said about that hasn't changed. And won't change. Because as it says, His word continues in the heavens and is truth from generation to generation. It's true and will always be true. And so, because of that, He's able to say in verse, verses 99 and 100, I understand more than all my teachers for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the elders for I search your commandments. There are lots of ways you can go out to try to find out about the world. Right? You can go out and try and have experiences. That's not a highly recommended one because you'll have a lot of bad ones. Right? You can go out and become a scientist, investigate the world scientifically and mathematically. Right? You can go out and read literature. You can go out, there's all kinds of ways you can try and learn about the world around you. But if you really want wisdom, if you really want to understand the world, you spend time with and you learn from the person who made it. Right? The person who created it, created everything, created us. That's where you really learn what's important about the world. All those other disciplines have their place. You can learn lots of interesting things about the world. Right? But when it comes to the things that are really most important, that wisdom we get from God. And we see that in, you know, that's the, the Traparian we sing on Pentecost. How God has revealed the fisherman is most wise. <laughs> Right? There were a whole lot of guys at Plato's Academy, which still existed in Athens at that time, who thought they were really wise. Definitely wiser than a bunch of dumb fishermen in, in Palestine. Right? But who were the ones who really understood what was going on in the world? It was those bunch of fishermen who were mostly illiterate. Whereas the guys studying at Plato's Academy really had no idea what was going on in the times they were living. And that's what this is that's what this is getting <coughs> so verse 105 your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my paths I swore and confirmed that I would keep the judgments of your righteousness I was humbled exceedingly O Lord give me life according to your word be well pleased with the free will offerings of my mouth O Lord and teach me your judgments my soul is always in your hands and I am not forgotten your law Sinners set snares for me, but I did not wander from your commandments. I inherited your testimonies forever, for these are the exceeding joy of my heart. I incline my heart to your ordinances forever for a reward. Transgressors I hate, but I love your law. You are my helper and my protector, I hope in your word. Turn away from me, you evildoers, and I shall search out the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to your teaching and give me life, and may you not disappoint my expectation. Help me and I shall be saved and I shall meditate always in your ordinances. You said it not all who departed from your ordinances. 
for their thought is unrighteous. I counted as transgressors all the sinners of the earth, for this reason I always love your testimonies. Nail my flesh with the fear of you, for I fear you because of your judgments. I work judgment and righteousness. Do not deliver me to those who wrong me. Take your servant to that which is good. Do not let the arrogant falsely accuse me. My eyes strain to look at your salvation and at the teaching of your righteousness. Deal with your servant according to your mercy and teach me your ordinances. I am your servant. Cause me to understand and I shall know your testimonies. It is time for the Lord to act. They broke your law. For this reason I love your commandments more than gold and topaz. Therefore I directed myself to all your commandments. I hated every unrighteous way. I've already seen this is the second time they've used this reference in verse 123 there. My eyes strained to look at your salvation. What is that talking about? Well, he's looking, the idea is that he's looking forward. Right? He's pressing forward. This, it is time for the Lord to act in 126. He's talking about, as we've talked about before, this idea of the day of the Lord. That there's this day that's going to come when God is going to intervene. Right? And he's going to set these things right that are out of whack now. And he's looking forward to that day. He's pressing forward in hope toward that day and hoping that it will be soon. And this is, of course, the parallel to this is what we see in the New Testament in terms of Christ's return. Right? This idea that we're looking forward we're looking forward to that day. Right? Now, how is that connected to the rest of what we're talking about? Well, in a very simple way, because when God comes on the day of the Lord, in this sense, or in our case, when Christ returns, what's going to happen? He's going to judge the living and the dead. Well, that's going to include us one way or the other, right? Judgment. Seems kind of weird to look forward to Judgment Day. <laughs> right? To look forward to Judgment Day. But he is. He is. He's looking forward to Judgment Day. He's looking forward to things being set right. Things being set right. And he can do that not because he's perfect, as we've seen. He hasn't, he's never said he's perfect. He said he's always striving after God's commandments, but he's mentioned several times repentance right? the reason he can look forward to judgment is that one of the things that's going to get straightened out is him one of the things that's going to happen is this unrighteousness that he's had to struggle with through this whole psalm we've been reading not just the external the people who are oppressing him but his own unrighteousness that he's had to repent of that he's had to struggle against but that's going to be condemned and be gone Right? It's not just the whole world or the human race that's going to get fixed. He's going to get fixed. So when he says transgressors, I hate, and also I count yeah. as transgressors and sinners of the world, he's coming himself in that. It's not just Yes. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, he's, setting a, he's set, not setting apart himself and all these sinners. He's setting apart the way of the Lord and the way of unrighteousness. Right? And that's that, that judgment of God. He's called that sin. Right? And therefore, those who transgress it are sinners. Regardless of whether whatever arguments they might want to make or <laughs> philosophies they might have worked out to relativize whatever they did, that's God's judgment. That's it. Yeah. Okay, so verse 129. Wondrous are your testimonies. For this reason, my soul searches them out. The revelation of your words gives light and it causes children to understand. I opened my mouth and drew in my breath for I long for your commandments. Look upon me and have mercy on me according to the judgment of those who love your name. Direct my steps according to your teaching and let no lawlessness rule over me. Ransom me from the slander of men and I will keep your commandments. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your ordinances. My eyes poured down streams of tears because they did not keep your law. Notice that verse 136 on the point you just made, Monica. <laughs> right? He's not happy about the condemnation of the wicked. Right? He's not happy that they're sinners. <laughs> He's not gloating. You know, you guys are going to get yours. <laughs> Quite the opposite. 
right? He's weeping that they're that they're going to end up getting theirs. Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright is your judgment. You commanded your testimonies exceedingly in righteousness and truth. The zeal of your house caused me to yearn for home, for my enemies forgot your words. I'm going to just pause right there on that 139. This is more that idea of him as a sojourner. Right? The zeal for your house caused me to yearn for home. His house being a reference, God's house being a reference to the worship, right? The tabernacle, the temple, right? What does it cause to yearn for? Not, oh, I remember when I was a little kid growing up and we went to church. It was nice. No, it's, he's yearning for his real home. Because when he's there before God in worship, he's getting a taste of where he's headed, right? Where he's headed. Verse 140, your teaching is exceedingly purified in fire and your servant loves it. I am young and beheld as nothing, but I have not forgotten your ordinances. Your righteousness is righteousness forever and your law is truth. Affliction and trouble found me, but your commandments are my meditation. Your testimonies are righteousness forever. Give me understanding and I shall live. I cry out with my whole heart, hear me, O Lord, I shall search your ordinances. I cry out to you, save me and I shall keep your testimonies. I arose at midnight and cried out. I hoped in your words. My eyes awoke before dawn that I might meditate on your teachings. Hear my voice, O Lord, according to your mercy. Give me life according to your judgment. Those who persecute me in lawlessness drew near. They are far removed from your law. You are near, O Lord. All your commandments are truth. From the beginning I knew your testimonies that you established them forever. Behold my humiliation and deliver me, for I have not forgotten your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life because of your word. Salvation is far from sinners, for they have not searched your ordinances. Your compassions are many, O Lord. Give me life according to your judgment. Many are those who pursue and afflict me, but I did not turn away from your testimonies. I saw those acting foolishly, and I yearned for you, for they did not keep your teachings. Behold, I love your commandments. O Lord, in your mercy, give me life. The beginning of your words is truth, and all the judgments of your righteousness are forever. Now notice here, verse 155. Again, salvation is far from sinners. Why? Because God's angry with them? Because God has wrath he's going to pour out all over them? (laughs) Because God hates them? No. For they have not searched your ordinances. The only reason... The only reason they're condemned, the only reason they're suffering, the only reason they have this bad destiny when God returns is because of their decision. Their decision not to follow the way of the Lord, but to follow their own ways. The idea being, at any point, they can repent. They can turn. They can turn away from the way they're going and follow the way of the Lord, and then they'll find salvation. Right? Because... Verse 151, you are near, O Lord. As uh, St. Paul quotes from another psalm, salvation is very near to you, it is in your mouth and on your heart. Meaning, these words, just listen to them. And salvation's right there. Don't have to jump through a bunch of hurdles. Don't have to... Just turn from what you're doing and live. Verse 161. Rulers persecuted me without cause, but my heart feared because of your words. I shall greatly rejoice in your teachings like one finding great spoil. I hate and abhor unrighteousness, but I love your law. I praise you seven times a day for the judgments of your righteousness. Great peace of all who love your law. It is not an offense to them. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and I love your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I keep your commandments and your testimonies, for all my ways are before you, O Lord. Let my supplication draw near before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your teaching. May my petition come before you. Deliver me according to your teaching. My lips shall overflow in song when you teach me your ordinances. My tongue shall speak of your teaching, for all your commandments are righteousness. Let your hand be for saving me, for I chose your commandments. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my meditation. 
My soul shall live and praise you, and your judgments shall help me. I went astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I have not forgotten your commandments. So at the end, we get sort of this last piece. Right? We've seen, you know, the difference between him and the sinners. Right? It's not that, that he's better or God picked him. Right? Or anything else other than he's, he's chosen to follow the way of the Lord as best he can. And he's repenting where he's failed. And the others are going their own way. We've seen that his attitude towards them what, was one of tears at what was befalling them. And then finally, we see here the last piece. And that's in verse 171 and 172. My lips shall overflow in song when you teach me your ordinances. My tongue shall speak of your teaching for all your commandments are righteousness. That all of this isn't just for his benefit. Right? When God gives him this understanding and teaches his commandments and sets him on the right way, it's not just so he will have eternal life, but it's so that he can bring this wisdom to get these sinners back onto that path, to get them to turn to God's commandments, to begin to love them, to woo them to love God the way he loves God. Okay? So the idea of evangelism is not new in the new in the new testament right it's right here it's the concluding part right when god has saved us when he's delivered us right our natural response is to go and bring that deliverance to others to go and speak to others about what god has done for us remember that was the whole purpose of him creating israel in the old testament he brought them out so that they would follow his ways and all the other nations would see. And then they would come and follow as well. Right? That was the goal. And so the same is true about each and every one of us. God's delivered and is delivering us so that we can bring that to other people, to those around us every day. Is there any significance in verse 164? Uh, I'm sure there's significance. I, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, I pray yeah, I praise you seven times a day. I'm sorry. I praise you seven times a day. Yeah. What is, uh, is there anything in the liturgy that seven? Because I was thinking of the worship service of three, the morning prayer, matins, and evening prayer. Well, there's actually, there's actually more than that. <laughs> well. Yeah. But, but that, we that we've got. Three, that well, it depends. There are monasteries. There's actually because there's uh, vespers, vespers, compline, midnight office, uh, matins, and then first, third, sixth, and ninth hour. So there's actually eight. Although they usually do ninth with the, you know you can combine them. <laughs> but the, the significance of the number seven, we've talked about before a couple of times. Things keep showing up in sevens, and the original reason, seven is a number that represents completeness. Okay. The original reason for that is one that, at seven the time, days. they believed there were seven planets. <laughs> so, they believed there were seven planets. One of which was the sun. But, <laughs> there were seven planets, so the seven planets made up the whole cosmos. There were seven. And so, the, the spheres... Getting into old cosmology. Pretend I drew seven because I'm lazy. Uh, <laughs> their idea there were these seven spheres that the planets were in. Right? And so when they talk about the heavens plural, that's what they're talking about. So, like when St. Paul today in the epistle reading we heard said somebody was caught up to the third heaven, the third heaven was the third one out. Venus, actually. So but, Venus. <laughs> but that's a figurative. It's figurative. It's not literal. The idea, but this is how they saw the universe. So if you take all seven of these, that would be the whole cosmos. So seven just became a number that represents completely. So it says seven times I pray, seven times daily means the whole day. I use the whole day. I go praise in here. Then is that what Paul was saying when I didn't know if I was in the spirit or in the flesh, but in the seventh? 
Right, that's where we get the term seventh heaven. Right, you say he's in seventh heaven, that means he's as overjoyed as you get. The seventh heaven would be the last one. Or the heaven of heavens. <laughs> right? The very last one where God is. Right? So that was a picture, that was an understanding of the way the universe looks. Obviously we have a slightly different one, at least in terms of the physical universe. But, but that was the idea that was originally behind it. But so the idea, so when we see the number seven, it's talking about this complete, this completion, the whole universe. So that's why we had the, we talked about this um, originally under the, the candle stand, the menorah. Okay, the there was in the temple, the seven branch candle stand, seven lights, right? Those seven lights on the candle stand represent the, represented the seven lights in the cosmos. So it was sort of represented the whole creation was the idea. But it's symbolic, not literal. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because their astronomy was so accurate for their navigation. Using the constellations, yeah. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, Psalm 118 got its own got its own evening. Next time we get together, which next week is both the Sojourner's Thanksgiving dinner here and then after that the choir festival. So we're not going to be having class next week. So in two weeks when we get together, um, we're going to be doing the next batch of psalms, which if you look ahead, you'll see they're called the Psalms of Ascent, sort of a little chunk. And as you can see, we have a whole bunch of little short psalms now <laughs> to make up for 118. But so we'll be covering basically the Psalms of Ascent is what we'll be talking about next time when we get together in two weeks. And uh, then once we get done with Psalms here, which we're closing in on, we'll get into wisdom literature proper. And you'll learn why, if you struggle with laziness, you should go and look at ants. That's my T, yes, that's my T's for the book of Proverbs. You will find out why, if you struggle with laziness, you should go and look at ants. <laughs> so. Thank you, everybody.